Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the, the Casual Friday edition. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is July 3rd, 2020. All right, welcome to another show, July 3rd. Tomorrow's a big day if you're an American. If you're <clears throat> from Britain, you're probably not a big day for you. That's understandable. You know, we understand half our audience is not celebrating July 4th. Like, we're celebrating July 4th. Before we get too far into the program, I want you to like this program. You do that on YouTube or Facebook. There's usually a thumbs up button. You click that and it lets Facebook and YouTube know that this program is important, not just to Kevin and George, but it's important to you. And that's free advertising to us. Uh, please share this program with colleagues, friends, family, whoever you want to comment. You guys are the best commenters any YouTube channel could ever have. We really appreciate that. Subscribe if not subscribed. And for those who really think we're not good to look at, we have a podcast. It's an exact copy of this program in audio format. You can listen to us there. We won't mind. George, July 3rd. Tomorrow's July 4th. Uh, I have many favorite memories growing up of uh, July 4th. I remember in middle school, I was in the marching band, so we had to do the, the parade in Balsam Lake, Wisconsin, where we uh, get, I, had, <clears throat> I was a saxophone player, probably the worst saxophone player in Wisconsin. And we'd have to march and step, and uh, it was just a fun time doing July 4th activities with parades. When Jill and I got married, we spent a couple of July 4th on the mall in DC watching the grandest uh, display of fireworks and music and uh, American propaganda you've ever seen. It was a lot of fun. How about you, George? Yes, uh, memories of summer camp at Center Harbor, New Hampshire on Lake Winnipesaukee and watching fireworks or my teen years uh, standing on the seawall in Palm Beach watching the fireworks off over the ocean huh. um, just a, a lovely time of family of uh, sentiment of, of the all-star game on television baseball sure uh, more uh, oddly enough we didn't think so at the time but more innocent days more comfortable days where there were more seeing things that seemed to unite us around certain beliefs and principles than there are today it's it's a hard time it's COVID, it's a recession, it's a depression, it's riots. Um, there's a lot going on in the world. I do think we will once again uh, encircle the banners of our constitution and our flag and the freedoms and hopefully re-understand that America, the United States of America is very unique um, in what it offers as a place to raise a family as a place to be employed, as a place to express freedoms found in our Constitution, and as a place to worship uh, how you want to worship. It's very unique in that. Well, uh, I agree with everything that you said, but we're up against a generation that is profoundly ignorant. Very ignorant, yes. Who, uh, I don't say they're stupid, I just say, say that they've not been educated well. And they don't have, and they've been educated to be ashamed of their past. They've mm -hmm. been educated uh, t not in what the uniqueness and the distinction and the, uh, 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 the what made people from all around the world come to the United States. But what about but about the human failings, which are human failings found in every society? Mm -hmm. So that we're basically dealing with a generation who has the benefits of what has gone before, but doesn't have the wit or the education uh, to appreciate them. I think the greatest highlight to the stupidity that I see is all across this nation, we're t throwing our statues out. And some statues I get, they're, they're pretty bad. But we're lockstep, everything's being tossed out, burned down, knocked over, uh, destroyed, maybe some put in museums, whatever. In Germany, they erected a statue last week. That statue, statue was of? Vladimir Lenin. Let's see, let's see. 
puts balance. So <laughs> how many tens of millions? 120 of million people in 80 years. I mean... You know, but he meant well. <laughs> he meant well. Uh, so you just... From us... I know my history teacher uh, from high school is just sitting there. I told you. Yeah. And, you know, up in uh, your hometown, Madison, uh, students sure. pulled down the statue of a Civil War hero. And this man was the leader of the anti-slavery. He was a Norwegian immigrant who fought to free the slaves mm -hmm. and was a leader of the emancipation movement. Mm -hmm. And because it's an old white guy on a statue outside the Capitol, these frankly ignorant and rather rather malnourished kids are uh, pulling down these statues. Well, you, and, you mentioned Madison, Bascom Hall, which is right at the top of the campus at University of Wisconsin, has Abraham Lincoln. And everybody's calling for his removal. Why? <sighs> it's like, you guys, he's the one man who was willing to sacrifice an entire country the entire country for the f fight of slavery but you know we just can't we just can't blame badly educated kids because they're people older than we are of our generation and uh, one of them is named justin <laughs> just, uh, who oh, yeah. is just either is as as ignorant and as shallow as these uh mal maleducated children or he is the most craven weather vane of, oh my, we don't have enough uh, non-white representation of the statuary in Canterbury Cathedral. Oh my, we're going to have to go through the Church of England churches and see if we have uh, the right proportion of black faces in the windows and statues and paintings and pictures. Hmm. This man is the Archbishop of Canterbury and he is the world's greatest ass as well as a Philistine. And the thing is, he's not stupid. He has a very good education. So either this is a deliberate choice to pander to the worst elements of society, uh, yeah, yeah. It's or what is, what's, what's, I just... 2020 is a crisis. And in previous crises throughout every generation, there's always been leaders to stand up and say, hold on, I got this. Justin Welby does not have this. I just listened to a wonderful podcast of Archbishop Foley Beach called Wake Up America. Foley Beach is probably the closest thing to a leader we have in these terrid times uh, right now. Yes, ACT is going through some growing pains and stuff right now, but I was extremely impressed with the Wake Up America podcast. I will put a link to that in the show notes. Um, this is this is a time a, a tough time, and George, I don't see a lot of leaders standing up and saying we got this. Well, it's wrong of me to put this at the feet of one man. No, it's, yeah. So, so Justin Welby, his moral compass, uh, frankly, is irrelevant to the greater issues of the day. But it is a convenient way to speak to the spiritual sickness that society is facing on mm -hmm. one level. We're entering a golden age. Uh, you look at the economy, uh, the battering it's taken and how quickly it bounced back. It's mm -hmm. bouncing back. We're looking at an unprecedented era of peace across the world. I mean, the, the problems we're facing with the Chinese are as of nothing compared to what we had in the Cuban Missile Crisis yeah. or at other periods of great international tension. We Everything on one level, on a dispassionate level, is moving in the right direction. But at the same time, the morale of the world and the countries and of people, it's a spiritual sickness. And Ephraim Radner, who is a professor at uh, Wycliffe College in Toronto, uh, is, a, is an acquaintance, a friend of this show, sure. huh. has written, wrote about the Episcopal Church about 10 years ago saying that the Spirit of God appeared to have been, have been withdrawn from the Episcopal Church. and. I can, I would say that is true of the Church of England today. So that all these things that Welby is trying to do to make it relevant, to make it hip, are meaningless with the absence of the Spirit of God animating the work of the Church. That does not mean, hear, hear me, I'm not saying that there are no spiritual 
faithful, powerful believers in the Church of England. Correct. I'm saying that the institution, church house in Westminster, there's a palpable absence of the Spirit of God in its deliberations and its thinking and its work, just as there is at 815 in New York City and in many diocesan offices in the Episcopal Church. And the, the, the point you make about Foley Beach is that though they're starting from a lower uh, rung of institutional history mm -hmm. and cash, I do think they're much more spiritually powerful in these hours than their counterparts in New York or London. Yeah, it's, as a lover of history, and I know you are too, these are interesting times to watch because you can get up and you can watch your news all day long and be very depressed. Or you can uh, go about doing your worship in church, do your work with work, enjoy your family, and go about life without looking at the news out there. And you're, you're unaffected because mm -hmm. there's, there's a minority of unhappy COVID people. There are a minority of rioters. There are a minority of things happening around the world that don't affect you if you're not watching the news. Years ago, not yet, too many years ago, I worked for Terry Mattingly, uh, who's another friend of this show. He's a, he's now retired, but he was a very prominent religion reporter, and he still has a column that's syndicated across the nation for his website, Get Religion. And Get Religion would look at religion reporting and would ask uh, the questions from a journalistic perspective. Are these reports being done according to journalistic standards of accuracy, integrity, balance, both sides, multiple sourcing. And the, basically the website would call out bad reporting. It wasn't ideological. It was a professional thing. Mm -hmm. Get Religion has basically, uh, nothing against Get Religion, the, the website, but we're now in a world where the New York Times, most of its major stories would fail the oh. journalistic integrity test. Absolutely. Of, relying upon anonymous sources, of not double sourcing, of not talking to both sides, of offering opinion as fact, of couching terms in uh, in ways that you don't know this, yet that you reported it's true. And for many, and I guess it's like being, having been in the sausage business, you know what goes into a sausage. And then when you start eating something and you know it's rotten, you know what they've done wrong. And we're in a world where we're seeing that. Um, now, see, here's the difference. Someone like Sean Hannity or Tucker Carlson or even uh, even Andrew Cuomo, they're opinion journalists. They're entertainers. Rachel Maddow ha was in a lawsuit recently, and she was cleared of slander because the court she's ruled journalist. that she's not a journalist. <laughs> she's an entertainer. Yeah. I'm not talking about those people. Mm -hmm. Well, all we have those. I'm talking about the bread and butter news shows. Well, I, I have a great example. Uh, as you know, uh, cases of COVID are going up. We're doing more testing. We're finding more people with COVID. Uh, Texas, Florida, Arizona, hot spots around the U.S. And I don't know if USA Today or New York Times, I don't remember the source, had the story where in Houston, 100% of the ICU beds are taken. Don't get COVID in Texas. You will die, surely. I'm like, wow. And even I felt a bit of fright. In just that short amount of time, 10 You're days. You're going to be visiting Texas, aren't you? The RV. <laughs> yeah. In, in a, a short amount of time, 10 days, the ICU went from zero to 100% in Houston. That's horrible. And then another, uh, I think it must have been the Dallas Morning News or something, did a follow up and said, yes, the Houston ICU is full of 71% normal patients, 29% COVID patients. The numbers have not increased. This is just how this large hospital manages uh, that. Uh, we see no increase in COVID hospitalizations. Well, I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I enjoy being scared for three or four days. Why do I have to this updated story? And that's what's happened. Journalism's over. Nobody is doing journalism like it was done in the 50s and 60s and 70s where every story had two sides. Here there's a one-sided story and there's no difference between the editorial page and the front page.
And that used to be an iron wall. Mm -hmm. um, the Guardian newspaper of London, which is one of the worst purveyors of slander journalism these days, at one time had a uh, had a you know a, a slogan that uh, comment is free, and what you're paying for is journalism. We'll let you decide, and then we'll give you our comment in a separate piece. We don't have that anymore. We have the the news reported as comment. Um, like these poor these two these two people in uh, St. Louis. Um, mm. The, the uh, Ken and Karen, they're called now. <laughs> well, the uh, on one hand, most right-thinking Americans would not be pleased that this guy is a personal injury lawyer. They would think, "Yeah, burn his house down." Uh, you know, he's. Uh, but nonetheless, well, he, but hold on, this, he's a poster boy for liberal progressive people who don't want tariff reform. I double mean, income, no yeah, children, yeah. Uh, living. You know, in a in a. McMansion and a gated community in St. Louis. Man, manly enough to wear pink polo shirts and khakis on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, and so the mob breaks into his private dis private uh, grounds, smash down the walls and the smash down the gates, mm -hmm. shout death threats, threaten to kill their dogs and this and that and he comes out and parades with an AR-15 and his wife with a pistol and and they're the villains they're the villains the district the state's attorney for law for St. Louis who is a piece of work to begin with yes. says we're going to investigate these people for violent response to peaceful protests on their front lawn it, it is a strange world we, we are currently in, George. But, uh, but, but, the, but the news that we're getting mm -hmm. is we're getting selected videos that mm -hmm. present either this side, that this man is a white supremacist nut, or the other side, that these people are uh, agitators looking for blood. They're just pure anarchists. We have no real reputable uh, ongoing journalistic enterprises um, from the major, from the mainstream media, that are seeking to find the truth within all this, they're yeah. seeking. To, you know, CNN had this man on the television, uh, not to find out what happened, but to basically ask him, "Well, why is Donald Trump using the image of you defending your home as a tweet?" Thinking that you know, taking this all back to national politics, which this has nothing to do with national. The man's a Democratic lawyer who gives money to Bernie Sanders, and he's. Being beaten up for, for having a gun because Trump retweeted it. It's just insane. It, you and I could sit here eight hours today just talking about the incredibly uh, useless journalism we've seen worldwide uh, over the last 12, 15 years. And uh, it would do no disservice to listen to us either because we, we watch this all the time. I do want to get to a little bit of church news. We are Anglican Unscripted, and I thought we could talk a little bit about, here it is, the double standard coming out of England. Uh, George Carey, Archbishop of Canterbury, uh, 30 years ago, 35 years ago. Uh, well, 35 that? years ago. Yeah, 35 he, years he ago. I'm sorry, he retired about 15 years ago. Okay. Um, wonderful Archbishop. Uh, has maybe or maybe not some skeletons in his closet because he may be or maybe not guilty of association of a student with whom he was a professor maybe maybe not for whatever reason he has been suspended from uh, bishop duties in the church of england uh, and in his diocese he was informed by his bishop another bishop who's soon to be the uh, archbishop of york does have skeletons in his closet, has made some ill-choiced um, uh, decisions in handling some investigations in his diocese, and not a word, not a peep out of, out of the Church of England. That's a double standard, right? Actually, a pat on the head saying, there, there, you've made a mistake, don't do it again. Oh, my gosh. Well, what are we talking about? Two weeks ago, George Carey was suspended and as of yesterday, George Carey says he still has not been told why he's been suspended. It's still in the dark. And the newspapers found out the same time as he did, and the only communications he's had is an email, an email 
from Bishop Stephen Croft informing him that he's been suspended. So poor Carrie's been hung out to dry for and the and the only and it's on the Jonathan Smythe investigation. Yeah. And then the only possible link, Carrie does not remember ever having met Smythe. He was not in the same circles. He didn't, you know, they just were not bumping into each other every weekend. Smythe was a part-time student in the early 80s when Carey was the dean of Trinity College in Bristol. And so the thinking is, well, maybe Carey should have known that he had a pervert in the student body. Maybe he was grading on a curve. And yeah. But we don't know. And Carey doesn't know. And it's been hidden, kept hidden from him. Meanwhile, Stephen Cottrell, 10 years ago when he was Bishop of Reading, uh, was approached about a domestic violence problem with one of the clergy, and he did nothing. He didn't call the police, he didn't do, tick off the right boxes, he didn't do all the stuff that he should have done. And it's finally percolated up to the top, and the, na and the same national safeguarding team that is recommending Kerry be suspended, not told what he's done, they're saying to Stephen Cottrell, they're there, don't do it again, you did it wrong, uh, we, we can read your mind and know what you were thinking 10 years ago. And you were basically being stupid. But we could read George Carey's mind 35 years ago and know that he was being malicious. Therefore, you're free to become Archbishop of York and oversee abuse investigations that your predecessor, unfortunately, lost because, you know, it was a flood in the basement of York Palace and the dog can, ate them. And hold on. Can we... This is a great opportunity for Anglican kind of scripted to help out here. Uh, to the new archbishop who's moving into the palace uh, in York, don't store any important papers in the basement. We've heard there's a tendency to flood. Well, or store important papers <laughs> in the basement because there's a tendency to flood. And if you want them to disappear, well, that's how to do it. <laughs> But the, the, the point of all this is, is that there, there is such a clear delineation between insiders and outsiders. Mm -hmm. The Bishop of Lincoln has been suspended for almost a year, almost a year now. And it has been said that he has not done anything that puts people into harm. He just didn't do something that pro he just didn't do it according to the standards, but we still don't know what that is. He's suspended for a year. Well, Stephen Cottrell is coming the Archbishop of York next week. Wow. Okay. And in other words, this is just such... When I talk about the Spirit of God having left the Church of England, here's an example yeah. of the spirit of man, of the spirit of partisanship, the spirit of party politics, trumping truth and integrity and honesty and decency. And where is... Cottrell's apology to the victims of the abuse that he overlooked. Where is his reaching out to these people? If he did it once, did he do it more than once? We just don't know. You know if and more. Here, and oh. the, the joke about Stephen Croft, the Bishop of Oxford, being oh. the one who sandbags Carey. Stephen Croft behaved badly in the Matthew Innocent affair. Yeah. And when is this all going to come out? When is Croft going to be disciplined? When is Croft going to be nailed? for his bad acts and his overlooking things, as well as the Bishop of Leicester and half a dozen other bishops who did not do the right thing. Well, they're all on Carey's insider team. Uh, I'm sorry, Welby's insider team. They're all church house insiders. They get a pass. But the Bishop of Lincoln, who's on the margins, and George Carey, who's retired. It's the George Bell story all over again. Let's sacrifice somebody who's expendable to preserve the preserve the center the core this is not a Christian institution no, no. And, and there's the evidence uh, the, the, and, the and fruits of the Church of England are rotted well right. here, here's a funny thing this really is the time I'm going to give advice to Gafka uh, Gafka you've got a great uh, message you got a crappy strategy excuse me no. uh, you know you, you're standing for for the gospel, for truth, you've got the Jerusalem Declaration, we know what you stand for, but you're not doing anything. Well, if you want to play in these, in the, if you want to fish in these waters, you have to use the right bait. 
go to the next Lambeth Conference because you will then have the numbers with the Global South and the disaffected other, other bishops to say to Justin Welby, I'm sorry, but we're going to change the Archbishop of Canterbury is, it the fir- is going to remain the Archbishop of Canterbury, but the head of the Anglican Communion is going to be elected by us. That's right. It's no longer going to be appointed by the British Prime Minister. And you can forget the Anglican Communi- uh, Community Council. A- yeah, AC, I mean, get out. You don't yeah, I mean, that. the Anglican Consultative Council is oh, run by a bishop awesome. of Hong, Archbishop of Hong Kong, whose own people accuse of being a stooge of the Communist Party. He he belongs to a Communist Front organization. He refuses to denounce the uh, usurpation of Hong Kong's uh, independence by this mainland government. Hmm. The man is a communist. I hate that, that sound like I sound like a nut job, <laughs> but it's true. He's a communist. <clears throat> he is a communist. He's a secret communist. <laughs> Now, uh, and this is the titular head of the Anglican Consultative Council, a man in the pocket who does the bidding of the communist government in Hong Kong, in Peking. We, we, we've, we've reached the point where we have an Archbishop of Canterbury who has no integrity whatsoever, uh-huh. who is just an empty suit. The head of the ACC is a communist stooge, and I'm not just throwing those things out. You you read what is being written in Hong Kong about this man and how we compare to the Catholics, who's Archbishop Cardinal Zen, who's retired now, but has said, I'm going to be arrested, but I'm not going to stop promoting democracy and freedom. Now, if GAFCON and the Global South got together and showed up at Lambeth, they would rule. They could introduce all these new reforms. They could take over the uh, the business meeting uh, agenda, and it would be a whole new ball game as far as who represents the leadership of the Anglican Communion started in 2021. I, no, I agree. The strategy should change now because the Archbishop of Canterbury has never been weaker in modern times. Now is your chance to go in there and correct that. Uh, the Anglican Communion, sadly, has never been weaker in modern times. Now's your chance to go in and crack that. The uh-huh. uh, We just saw the formation of the province of Alexandria, uh-huh. which is the Diocese of Egypt, North Africa, the Horn of Africa, and Gambella, which is part of Ethiopia. Right. That split off from the province of uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in the Middle East. Middle East yeah. I hate to be negative, but you know, Munir Nice for the last two, three years has had to play ball with London to make sure that his dream of an independent province comes up because it was under the thumb of Welby and Josiah Dawu Faron and the Archbishop of Hong Kong. That political gamesmanship prevents people from speaking out. It prevent it's what causes uh, for the needy churches, needy in the sense of. Uh, of economics or in political or they're under pressure at home from their government they need what they think is the help of london well london doesn't do squat but they like to give the impression that they do something because it'll make the newspapers and we really do need to have a revolution in the organizations and structure uh and throw out these time servers and throw out these men not of god but careerists who have led the church to this impact, led to the church of this place. You use the word revolution. I'm going to stick with reformation, but that's because it's casual Friday. George, we had a great show today. Uh, how many minutes did we get in there? Wow, about 20 some minutes. That's cool. Okay, people, today is moving day. I don't know if you can hear in the background. My wife is ripping up boxes and, and, and putting things in the corner because we're going to move those items to the RV today. Today we're uh, moving out of the condo for a couple months and we're going to go travel this uh, uh, <laughs> this nation which is suffering greatly in, in many different ways uh, from the pandemic, the riots, the recession, maybe depression, the upcoming uh, election in November. What was the latest thing I saw? Oh, there's something else happening in July. Just horrid times. So we thought, and as people know, I'm a contrarian. When the world's going to hell, take a vacation. That's that's just the way I operate. So the next time you see uh, this show, probably Monday, we'll be recording from somewhere in the RV. I'm not really going to tell people where we're headed. I will tell you where we've been because I don't want people knocking on the door, Mr. Coulson. 
you're under arrest again. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 609 of Anglican Unscripted.